Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And this week is a marine mammal highlight. So we put it out to you guys between the ribbon seal and the Waddell seal. And it was overwhelming. <laughs> Not surprising. <laughs> uh, the ribbon seal won because it's ridiculously gorgeous. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very pretty. Now the Waddell seal got some cool stuff um, that you you will you guys will like, but we can totally get why the ribbon seal won. It's okay, <laughs> the, the pretty one can win this week. Um, so we're going to be talking about the ribbon seal, and um, we are again in our, our new format where we're it's just Cat and I, and we are going to kind of discuss the um, the status and and the distribution that kind of thing, and then I'll talk about diet behavior. And then she'll talk about threats and stuff. And then I'll talk about some new research that's uh, going on to kind of wrap things up in a positive manner. So um, with that, we are going to get into especially what the beautiful, gorgeous ribbon seal looks like along with the distribution. So Kat, take it away. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have not seen a picture of a ribbon seal yet, get yourself on Google. I'm sure we will put one in here somewhere for those of you yeah. watching on YouTube. It'll um, be on the YouTube on the, on the picture with us, but yes. Perfect. But yeah, so they are absolutely gorgeous. So of course they get their name from their distinctive black and white markings or black, dark and light markings. They're not always black and white. Um, but basically they have kind of lighter bands on a darker background that creates this almost look of having like these lighter ribbons wrapped around the seal itself. Um, so I yes. thought it was like the, the zebras where it's like, is it black on white or white on black? But they did say oh. that it was black. With the white yeah. Goodness, yeah. And it is because they're, it's more of the dark coloring than the, the lighter coloring. Right. So the bands encircle the neck of the seal and then also the four flippers and the hips. And um, interestingly, males have the most striking colors. So females be more of like a silvery gray to a dark brown with paler ribbons, whereas the males tend to have that really like dark colored coat and the really bright white bands on there which kind of um, goes with things males oftentimes are the prettier ones you know think peacocks and things like that right exactly yeah. they tend to have the more more striking coloration typically at least um, in animals not humans yeah that's true. <laughs> <laughs> i mean sometimes they do in humans too true. you never know that's true um, <laughs> So with the juvenile seals, they do have um, indistinct ribbons, which gradually deepen in color as they age. And this takes about three years. So the new color comes in with each successive molt um, and they molt annually. And so each time they molt, they get more of that color deepening in. Um, and the pups are born with a lanugo or white coat, which molts after about three to five weeks. And so this is basically to help keep them more inconspicuous in their snowy habitat. And I have a fun name for them when we get to the end to some fun know, facts. So I'm excited. Yeah, it's I'm really excited cute when it has to do with that Lanugo coat. Oh, fun. Okay. Um, I did not find this. So I'm very excited to hear about it. <laughs> um, so in terms of their size, in comparison to the other ice seals, um, ribbon seals are kind of medium in, in the ranges. So they're about five to six feet long and weigh between about two to 300 pounds. Um, so in comparison to some of the other seals that live in a similar habitat, they are smaller than the bearded seals, which we have already talked about on the podcast, right. but they're larger than the ring seals. Um, so they're about the same as the so-called spotted seals up there, which I think are very similar to, to harbor seals. Mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of right in the middle of those ice seal size ranges. Um, and they are, as you might guess, very distinctive. So if you see one, you're pretty much not going to mistake it for something else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And in terms of where you might happen to see one, um, nice little segue there. Mm. Um, the ribbon seals are found typically in the North Pacific Ocean and the adjacent parts of the Southern Arctic Ocean. So in terms of the U.S. waters, this would be off the coast of Alaska, in the Bering Sea, the Chukchi, I can never say this. I, know, I was just like, I can't say it right. <laughs> I almost got it first time, not quite. And then the Western Beaufort Sea. So they are as I've already kind of alluded to, they're very strongly associated with sea ice. So mm -hmm. particularly during the molting and breeding seasons, which I'm sure Cindy will talk about more. Yeah. Um, but they don't really remain on the sea ice out with those periods, which is interesting. So 
they're actually most of the time in the water kind of swimming around um, right and then in those specific periods they're on on the sea ice and we have had solitary ribbon seals found way out of their normal ranges um, in the past and we did have one individual that was hanging out in the inland waters of Washington state a few years ago so you might have seen news articles about one on a dock in Seattle I believe yeah um, I have a, several a little years bit ago yeah I have a little bit more on that it was uh they it was on August 22nd 2016 that they found one on the Long Beach Peninsula and they thought it might be the same individual um, as the one that was seen in 2012 that was seen in the Duwamish River in Seattle, Snohomish County, and Steamboat Slough in, Slough in Everett. Slough. It's Slough, there we go. I was like, I know I said that wrong. But <laughs> I don't know what it is. Because it doesn't, it's not spelled. It's a weird spelling. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, and then also in Canada. So it, it, his name was B3110, and they knew it was a male because of, it was, like you said, very strongly banded. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting, I saw that and they didn't have any updates. So that was like from 2016. I don't think they were able, I guess maybe they didn't confirm. Yeah. Was, and that's, I was trying to look to see if they had any updates on it too, of like, where did it go next? And I, did, I mm -hmm. couldn't find anything. So, but he's way outside his range. Yeah. yeah. So that's the thing. So again, like, and we'll get into this a little bit with the threats, but it is the, again, as with all animals, there are these individuals that seem to seek outside their normal range, but you know, it, it will be interesting to see if, if, and how their ranges change mm -hmm. um, with climate change. Right. So in terms of their current status, just to kind of wrap up the intro here, um, current populations are estimated at about 200 to 300,000 globally. However, as with all of these kind of northerly or, you know, very ice rangy animals that we've talked about on the podcast, ranges are difficult to, or sorry, counts are difficult to obtain just because it is so difficult to get up to some of these areas and get a really good count. We're talking um, about like super easy, calm water, you know. <laughs> Great, of course, like, you know, no difficulty with flying planes and like ice over conditions. Of course not. Of course not. Um, and also because for most of the time, they are actually fairly solitary and out to sea, you have to really limit your counts to those periods that they're hauled out on sea ice. So there, it's a very small window that you can actually count the animals. Um, so that's roughly what we're looking at in terms of global population. But again, the, there's a pretty big margin for error there because we really don't know 100% what right. the populations are and they are protected by the marine mammal protection act throughout their range very good as they should be yes absolutely uh -huh. so over to you for some diet and behavior cool so intrigued. um a lot of this has to do with those times where they're hauled out on the sea ice <laughs> understandably as you alluded to um that you know, like she said as you said they're relatively solitary most of the time in the open ocean um but they, they say loose aggregations in the pack ice. And that's usually, again, to like many of the seals we've actually already talked about, like elephant seals and things like that. Most of the times in the water, they come to land to give birth and to molt. Mm -hmm. And that's, or sea ice, excuse me. They don't go usually on land, unless you're that weirdo True. that comes down to the inland waters of the Salish Sea and hangs out in a dock. Um, but, and you know what, you gotta think about like, he's basically just looking at sea ice. So what did he think when he comes down and is like, this hard, you know, hard surfaces, these docks and stuff, yeah. like a brave seal for just jumping up on that. But um, I thought this was really interesting is that behaviorally, they're not afraid of people at all. Which is kind of interesting, but I feel like kind of makes sense because how often are they really exposed to people up there? Exactly. So they're not afraid of passing boats or humans, um, unlike other Northern seals, which are mm. um, they're relatively unwary of their surroundings. They're like, whatever, okay, you're just there. Um, but what they think that suggests is that they weren't exposed to the same level of predation and the predation would come from polar bears and foxes, for example. Okay. So if in their range or wherever they are, they just, they don't have predators that really go after them. So then they don't really have to worry, I guess. Well, and I guess, I mean, I guess and you would still have the issue with sea ice with polar bears, for example, but if mm -hmm. they're mostly out to sea and yeah. mostly kind of solitary, that yeah, kind they're not of really, makes sense. Yeah. yeah they're, they're not really, really encountering land yeah. animals that often yeah yeah, yeah. interesting exactly. which is i mean it, it's one of those things where you think about it like well but wouldn't you be more scared to, to some degree because right. like, oh my god what is that but i guess not it's just like hmm interesting things. yeah i thought it was kind of interesting now this was super fun do you so do, first of all does everybody know how seals are on land when they try to walk right they can't walk because they can't tuck their hind end underneath them like sea lions so they do basically the worm and they go blah, 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 blah. that's the like, wriggle along yes they wriggle along 
they and they call it a caterpillar like movement where they're just like blah, 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 blah. what's interesting is these guys don't use that caterpillar movement they yeah i did not know this they alternate their four flippers instead of using the both of, like usually the seals will use both at the same time to kind of go right move and so fall behind like it along these that. guys go left to right and then sway, sway their hips in a snake like Ooh, so they're yeah. like they're, they're like doing like, this rrr, rrr, rrr. Yeah. wow that would be so cool to see which i know and which kind of goes i mean they got the ribbons going around on them so they're like moving like these guys ribbon. are just on a different vibe mm-hmm. they're like well we're just gonna do it all different because like, we can we, we are doing <laughs> Um, I just can imagine they're like just sashaying down, just being like, that's yeah, right, that's right. That's right. Look look at me at me. I'm beautiful. I'm that's beautiful. funny. Exactly. Wow. I thought that was really cool. That is cool. So I would actually need to look up a video of that because it's <laughs> gotta be fun. Oh. All right. So um in the summer, they're in the open ocean. So we know a little about them during that time, as you've already said. Um, and it's that um, and I'll get in that to the reproduction. It's usually April, May-ish that they're um on the ice. So uh, they'll follow the sea ice uh, and they can't maintain breathing holes through more than four to six inches of ice. Mm, So they're usually around the unconsolidated ice. So the ice flows so that they don't have to worry about breaking ice to breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Molting, uh, well, the adults molt in May to July and the uh, juveniles a little earlier and they're gonna reproduce a little bit earlier than that, like I said. Um, So that's pretty much what we know about their behavior. Like yeah. I said, it's not super detailed because we just see them for a few weeks, really. Um, and even in that time, it's it's difficult to get to them. Mm-hmm. So a diet, we know even less. Um, they eat a variety of fishes, cephalopods, right, which would be octopus and squid, uh, crustaceans, which would be shrimp and things like that. So, um, but again, this info is limited on the feeding habits um, and mostly respect, res- that are restricted to spring when they feed less. So the time that we can view them or, or understand what they're eating, they're not eating as much because they're reproducing and molting, which is a time that they don't tend to eat. So it's kind of awkward <laughs> that that's the time that we can study what they eat. Right, so, unfortunate, unfortunate right. for us. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we, who, who really knows what they eat? But um, they have shrimps, crabs, squid, walleye, pollock, arctic, and saffron cod. I've never heard of saffron cod, but I love it. Love it. Ooh, I wonder if they're young. I, um, I, do, I know, right? Um, eel pout, which is another great name. Uh, Kaplan, Greenland, halibut, delicious, halibut is wonderful. Uh, Pricklebacks, herring, and sand lamps are examples of what they have for, for food. Um, they are made uh, for deep diving. Um, they dive up to 200, and I saw up to 300 plus meters. Um, and they do seem physiologically well adapted to deep diving. Uh, and they seem to prefer to forage near the bottom, which would make sense if they're deep divers, uh, along the continental slope up there. So that's pretty much what we know about the diet. Which honestly, uh, it's kind of impressive that we even know that's right? still like a pretty decent summary. Mm-hmm. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So we know a fair amount, but we, but imagine like if this is only the small amount of time that we're seeing them and they're feeding less during that time, like what do we not know? Even if we right. know that much, you know? Yeah crazy. So reproduction wise, um, these guys are aquatic mating. So they mate in the water. Um, they are sexually mature around one to two to five years of age. Um, and girls are a little bit before males. Girls are two to four males are three to six. Um, and, uh, this will may depend on environmental conditions, right? So when is it Mm. the right time to, to mate and that kind of thing. Um, they give birth again far offshore on those seasonal pack ice um, over five to six weeks during April and May. And the pups are usually weaned by mid May. And then, of course, they breed again after weaning. So, same, same MO for all pinniped species basically. They haul out, they give birth, then they mate. And then they have that what we call delayed implantation. So, in order for the timing to work out for them to do everything the same again the next year, they only have an eight and a half month gestation which means they need a two and a half month pause. <laughs> it's going to fertilize that egg and then pause it. Um, and it doesn't implant into the uterus until two and a half months or so. And then it implants. And then that way they are ready to give birth at the right time the next year. So cool. Um, I know it's uh, every time. Delayed you know, implantation just blows my mind. I just it's think just it's the coolest thing ever. I want to know ever. like how, how does mind, uh, how does, what goes on that goes, now's the time. Right, right. Physiologically what's happening there. Yeah. Right. That'd be 
It's so cool. Cool. So cool. Anyway, um, they nurse for about th three to four weeks. So very similar to other, um, other seal species where their weight more than doubles. And then they may lose half of that as they learn to dive and hunt on their own. So after three to four weeks, mom goes, have a nice life, child. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And they have to figure it all out on their own. So wow. in that time, yeah, it's really, uh, it's really rough on them. Um, so they're, you, they need that fat to survive because they're not, you're not going to be good at catching fish right away. You're just, it's not. Um, and they did say, I had a, I had a fun fact that I'm just going to add in here um, is that mortality during the first year is 44%. That's really high. Really high. So wow. most, most mammal species, 25% is a, a normal first year mortality rate between disease and predation and just not making it and that kind of thing. Um, so that's really high. And, yeah. and I guess it makes sense. It's a pretty rough area up there, you know? Well, and I guess, I mean, also just thinking about how pelagic they are, like you're just yeah. out in the open ocean. Like, yeah, yeah. there's a lot, a lot of things that could kill you out there. There's Yikes. a lot of things that want to eat you. Right. Eat you. But then also just, again, you're not good at finding food, just becoming mm -hmm. malnourished and having to fight through the waves and, you know, deal with the cold and yikes. Wow. That's exactly. a lot though. Yeah. I mean, if you go for a couple of weeks without eating in that kind of environment, like you're mm -hmm. going to be rough. Yikes. Um, during the nursing time, the may, the mother may occasionally feed. So some seal species don't feed ever. And then some kind of do sometimes. Um, so they, she will occasionally feed during that time. Um, and as, uh, Kat says, the pups are born with that new beautiful Lanugo coat, uh, that help the, could, because the snow drifts, the ice ridges and the moms are the only protection they have from weather. So mm -hmm. that warm coat really keeps them from dying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Kat already talked about how they gain their, their rings over the next four years or so. Uh, and the picture of the baby is really cute. You can actually see the line, like it's a really thin line of where it's going to come out. Like, oh my God, it's so, so cute. It's, it's so cool. cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I really, I'm almost wanting to tell you what the cute name is, but I'm going to wait for the fun facts. Okay, that's okay, so okay, fine. So that's what we have for um, behavior and diet because, again, these guys are just crazy. And all of this we know from basically May to June-ish. <laughs> the rest of the time we're like, oh no, they do something out there in the open ocean kind of cool um so with that we will take a quick break before we come back with the rest of the episode And we're back. Now Kat is going to tell us about the threats for these guys. Yeah, so let's start off with the most obvious one, uh, which is climate change. So again, these podcasts that we're talking about Arctic or ice-based species, um, this is going to be very impactful. So of course, um, increasing temperatures sea in, in the sea in general um, are going to be massively impacting the sea ice and just like breaking it up more consistently. Receding sea ice is a huge thing for these guys because they are so dependent on it for that molting, birthing, and breeding periods. Um, and they're also really sensitive to sea, sea temperature changes um, that affect the timing and extent of the sea ice formation. So of course, like if they're planning on coming back to a specific spot where they know there's sea ice and it's not there, you're literally just swimming around the open ocean going like, well, I'm sure it was here last year, where'd it go? Um, and there's, a, there's a term for that now. I'm not, of course not remembering what it is, but it's that that timing of the things coming together when you're supposed to do something and it mismatching. Oh, trophic right. mismatching, something like that. Where it's yes. Like yeah. Right. So with that, I mean, again, just if, well, I mean, unfortunately, not if, as the sea ice is changing. Right. So is their ability to find these locations where they can actually successfully molt and birth and give and and breed. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately projections that people have done with modeling um, have indicated that with the increasing sea surface temperatures um, and as our climate warms, ribbon seal populations will start to decline um, simply because they, it will be much harder to find these areas of sea ice to haul out on and have these really crucial life history periods um, successfully. Right. And also well, just hearing about that mortality rate, like that's also yeah. massive. If they already have a, like a 40-ish percent mortality rate just in general of like that first year. Mm -hmm. 
that's really tough. Well, and then their behavior too. So what if now they're forced to be in areas that are closer to polar bears and foxes and stuff? They're not wary. They're going to get eaten. And do they yeah. have enough population and enough time to, for others to figure to out learn. Be where it right? Or is it just yeah. knock them out and that's it, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So yeah, with that, and again, just, you know, even if they, even if they switched and started hauling out on land, say like, say the sea ice recedes to the point where they have to go find a land base, that's going to be massively different for how they're experiencing all of those things. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge one, obviously for these guys, especially because they are so interdependent with that sea ice. Um, Another knock-on effect of that reduction in sea ice is the increase in vessel traffic in that area. So, of course, as these areas open up, more and more vessel and shipping traffic is going through there because they can. Um, and it's a shorter distance to just go over the top a lot of times than it is to go down, up, and around. Um, so that's an increasing potential threat. It's not too much of an issue right now as far as we know, but that's an increasing source of disturbance and possible threat to the seal populations. And, um, and sounds, I'm going to talk a lot about vocalizations. Because that's how yeah. we know a lot about what we know about them. So that can, you know, mask, it mask, can mask them. They can, you know, there's lots of right, stuff. right. And as yeah, with the next one with the oil and gas development mm -hmm. too, that's another big impact there. So it's again, you're you're talking about pile driving and hammering down at the ocean. So that that's a huge noise disturbance. Plus those additional vessels, plus the potential for oil or toxic spills. Right. Um, so basically just increasing activity in general is not going to be good for these guys, especially as you said, if they're not wary particularly um that's that's going to be a problem yeah um and it's curious that they're they're not wary because they are still harvested in certain yeah. parts of the world so that's it's not that too yeah it's not permitted in the u.s waters but it's still allowed in parts of russia mm -hmm. um and they do still have commercial harvests of ribbon ribbon seals um and these have been high enough in the past to cause significant population reductions mm -hmm. so and I'll, I'll have something in the, in the new in the new research that's talking about sustainability of those kind of things. So okay, cool, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I know they've they've put some quotas in in place. Um, I believe in parts of Russia to limit large harvests, but they mm -hmm. are taken um, at a kind of consistent background level in these annual harvests that they do. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, because we don't know a ton about these guys, we don't have a ton more information on what specific threats might be impacting their populations, but. Um, obviously I'm sure some background level of predation is occurring as well. Um, things like killer whales up there and, and polar bears, I'm sure as well, um, would be taking these guys, but that is all that I have for the threats. Yeah. And that's what the, without like the, I'll, I'll mention this in a minute, but the potential biological removal, right? So that's the PDR, yeah. that's the level, how many can we take that will still maintain the population as it is and not make it go down and mm -hmm we don't know enough about these guys to really make a good note of what that is. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which was interesting. Cause I think I did see something that they actually, they were listed as like, yeah, as like, you know, threatened or new threatened or something. And then they actually mm -hmm. changed that status back. Like, Oh, I think they're doing fine. Yeah. So, so it was like, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like, <laughs> do we know do that? Do we know that enough to do that? How did you do that? So actually, so I'm going to, this is a good segue, right? And I'm just going to go straight into that one. Go for it. Um, yeah. yeah uh, because they were talking about the substance harvest in Alaska. So they do have uh, for native native tribes there. Um, and they ringed bearded spotted and ribbon are sales are important for the native Alaskan communities. Um, and so the, the, the official PBR potential biological removal is the maximum number of animals that can be removed from a stock while allowing the stock to reach or maintain its optimal sustainable size. So, you know, sustainability, right? Um, so what they did was interesting is that they didn't have, uh, basically there's no quantitative evidence as to whether the amount the natives are taking is sustainable or not. And so mm. they went back and they used data from 1992 to 2014, and this is a 2019 paper, so quite recent. Um, they used 41 of 45 or 55 ice seal hunting communities. So there's just quite a few. Uh, and they calculated average removals as well as they extrapolated out using a maximum harvest value to account for those that are underrepresented, right? So there's right. Not, you're not going to count every single one of them. So that gives them a more liberal estimate along with the right, uh, you know, uh, average one. Um, and so they, they looked at all, all of those and with in relation to what information we do know about what the, the population levels are, and that quantitative evidence said that both the average and the liberal estimates were under the PBR for all the species. So mm -hmm. the best available data shows that those particular harvests are sustainable. Okay. Well, that's good. 
Yeah. So, but I mean, does that really take into account all the, all these other things that you were just talking about that add in, you know, it, that, it, that could change. Right. But right mm-hmm. now, at least those ones, I don't know if there's possibly others in, you know, in non-U.S. waters, other harvests that might be not as well balanced. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But at least in Alaska, it seems like whatever being taken is, is sustainable, which is encouraging. Right. But it sh- should hopefully be. Um, so the other research, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to preface the new research with they're hard to study due to their pelagic and ice edge associated existence, making observation, capture, tagging and tagging difficult, unsafe, and for the most part, logistically unfeasible. Pretty much sums it up right there. Yeah, I got that and I, I took that from one of the papers and I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Like, Literally sums it up. unfeasible. <laughs> that's just not going to happen. So all of the re- all the research, except for one other paper that I'm going to talk about, all has to do with the vocalizations. Mm-hmm. So they're putting acoustic recorders out and just listening over you know years at a time usually. Which I have a fun fact about their vocalizations. I'll see if you mm-hmm. mention it or not. Cool. But you okay, yeah. Well, that's be interesting okay. to see if it if it matches up. All right. Um, so uh, there's a couple of different studies. These are all kind of I'd say 2014, 2011, and there's a 2018 one and 2020, I think. Um, and they're all looking at just the, the different types of vocalizations that they have and when, when they see them. So in the, this one was North Barrow, north of Barrow, Alaska from 2006 to 2009. Um, and they recorded uh, in the spring breeding season again, because most of these vocalizations are happening then because that's when they're there. Um, they have down sweeps, roars, and grunts. Um, and they only detected them in the fall of 2008 during that open water period. Um, and they added three new calls. So they have yowls, growls, and hisses. Oh, they hiss? That's yeah, cool. I know. And what's interesting is that those new ones only happened along with one of the other regular ones that they knew beforehand. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a combo, right? So they have down sweeps, roars, and grunts, which hmm. were documented in like 19, 1977 and 2011 papers. And then these were newly added. Then they, they, they had stereotyped call sequences that were common. So wow. yeah, so they're saying the most common was a grunt, yell grunt. Sure, <laughs> that, that, as it is, you know, just exciting. casually. Wow, but they had all these so different like combinations of those and a few of them that were very, you know, stereotyped hmm. a lot. So, um, and then they, were, they compared recordings from 1982 and 1967 that showed a high degree of stability in the call repertoire across a very large spatial and temporal scale. So this was in different mm-hmm. locations, very far apart, and also way different in time. And they still had the same common, um, common themes and common vocalizations. Wow. Which is kind of cool. And the vocalizations would last cool. from five minutes to one hour. An hour. Oh my gosh, yeah, for an hour? Like yelling. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. It's pretty crazy. And I think, you know, a lot of these are probably having to do with reproduction because it's, you know, it's around that time. So maybe right. that's what they're doing. They're just calling out to the females being like, yo, or maybe it's the females. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Um, let's see. Uh, the other one was, there was one in 2011, the Bering Sea showing that the peak activity was, of course, in April and May. Um, tightly coupled to the sea ice presence. So the onset of detection was associated with thicker and more extensive sea ice cover compared to other, because they're so relying on that for their reproduction. So they're not gonna go there and do the things until there's ice there to do them on. Makes Mm -hmm. sense. Um, And they were detected only when ice cover in the area exceeded 80%. Okay. So they have a habitat preference for that, a requirement for a more stable ice platform. Um, And so that goes back to those threats, like yeah. that may change of where they can do these things and when they can do them, depending on when the ice occurs. Right. Or do they start to flex and be like, okay, well, we'll do it at 75% or 70%, right. you know? Um, so that is a, a harbinger for trouble in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they did, there was one, one in 2018, they were looking in the sea of, I'm going to not say this right, Okotsk. Okay, or something? Otkos, I think. Yeah, it's in Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And these were from 2012 to 2014. They produced sounds in the breeding and non breeding season. So they did show that they did that. Um, They down suits were detected uh, when sea ice was present more in March during the breeding season again. Um, But they decreased in the middle of the day, indicating they were likely hauled out during that time. 
Oh, interesting. So, yeah, so vocalizations at night and early morning probably reflect the increased opportunity for attracting a female. So that's apparently the right mm. time to call. Gotcha. Don't call me in the middle of the day when I'm working, being hauled out. Right, or sleeping, correct. being hauled right, out. Sleeping. That's just rude. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Don't call me when I'm sleeping. Uh, like, don't wake, don't wake a girl up. It's not cool. Um, so that basic was basic rules. <laughs> yeah, showing, a, right? The dating rules, exactly. They, everybody got them. Um, then there was another one that was in 2019 that was in the um, uh, Bering, Chichki, Ch I say that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Uh, and Beaufort Seas. Um, they found um, that basically this was showing that the Beaufort Sea Shelf and the Northern Bering Strait and the Southern Chichki Sea were ecologically important during that open water season. Um, mm -hmm. Activity was higher at nighttime again than during the daytime prior to the peak calling period. But during the peak calling period, that dial rhythm was less pronounced. So I think at mm. some point they just go, I'm just going to talk all the time. <laughs> Screw the rules. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to do what I want. Um, and then the vocalizations, both in number and the proportional use of downscapes and the bandwidth all increase during the breeding season. Okay. So yeah, um, like calling louder and more frequently, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's getting more intense. Mm -hmm. um, and they, this, this is my favorite one. There's a new call type that they called it the shuffle. The shuffle. Yeah. And I don't know what it, what it sounds Ooh. like, but I like it. I like the name. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. I like it. So we obviously don't know everything there is to know about their call types and to keep finding more different ones. Um, another paper in 2016, this is the last one that I'll talk about for vocalizations um, that showed geographically specific vocalizations in autopsy um, suggesting discrete population. So mm -hmm. they had down sweeps had two characteristics that were different than in the bearing and the chichki. They had undulating sections and longer duration. And mm -hmm. so they think that the, there could be some vocal differences between populations. Um, which is interesting. Yeah. Like yeah. how much, you know, I don't know how much, do they meet up? Do they go out in the open ocean and meet up and have a big party right. geogra geographically? I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so some cool stuff that's being found out about these guys through that, those passive acoustic devices, which we've talked about in other podcasts, but that really is such a huge thing for, especially see ones like this, where you're out in the middle of the ocean, like it's just, it's logistically hard to research these guys. So yeah. That acoustics really gives us a lot, um, helps us. Mm -hmm. um, the last one that I'm gonna, that was interesting that I came across, it was uh, really technical, um, but it was about viruses, which is mm. kind of cool. So they have a seal pick, pick or no virus, pick, pick or no virus, yes. Um, seal pick or no virus one, species aquamavirus A. Okay, nice. These, yeah, novel pinniped pick or no viruses in harbor seals and ribbon seals. They use stranded animals. And the long and short of this is that the ribbon seal picanovirus, uh, the genetics show that it is an acromavirus genus, but that the that ribbon seal one is a novel strain of that aquamavirus A. So the ribbon seals oh, have their own specific section of it, I guess. Okay. Um, but the role of picanoviruses and diseases of marine mammals remains to be determined, as well as host range, transmission, and prevalence. It can be subclinical to severe. So, I mean, honestly, kind of like what's happening right now with COVID, right? Some people don't get sick at all. Some people get really sick. Um, and so we just don't know a lot about that virus and, and its role, but they, they uh, isolated it and showed that it was a, a specific strain to ribbon seals. So could that go back to the threats? Could that be an issue with changing behavior and whether they're getting this? And if it becomes, if they're stressed, is this gonna become more prevalent and could be a problem? Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Right. Um, so that's, that's pretty much like, I, I looked through quite a bit and it was all just vocalizations and using those past acoustics, but found some pretty cool stuff. So they are yeah. researching it. They are looking into these guys more and um, it'll be interesting to see what we learn as the technology advances. For sure. So with that, we have fun facts. Should I just start off with the fun? Yeah. Okay, I've, I've kept you guys long enough. So the pups in the Lanuga are described as soft velvety clouds of unbridled joy and obesity. Oh my goodness. Right? It's the best. That's the best. Joy thing. and obesity. That is amazing. <laughs> and if you look at oh the pictures, like, you're right. It just is. They are ridiculously cute. Soft velvety clouds of unbridled joy and obesity. 
So, oh my gosh, I love that. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh that should God. be on a card. I feel like that needs to be on a card. Oh my God, that would be a great card. Just, just right? to make me happy. Like, just to make yeah. me happy. Here's yeah. Just of thinking, steel. thinking of. Well, you probably should you because that maybe might be misinterpreted, but. <laughs> Thinking of Never you, mind. I take, I, I take that back. But yes, just a, here's something to make you laugh. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I hope you have a day of un- unbridled joy and maybe not lose you. But like, <laughs> uh, uh, so anyway, it, I thought that was like the perfect description because oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, I will share real quick the one about related to their vocalizations, oh, yes. um, which is that they are the only seals. Ribbon seals are the only seals that have an internal air sac. <gasps> And it's on the right side of their body, right over the ribs. And so they think that this might be used in producing some of those underwater vocalizations, which kind of makes sense when you have such a huge range of vocalizations too. And they're all very, like really different. Yeah, really different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, I, w- I had that too. And it was like, I was like, it's outside of their ribs. That's so weird. Right. And so then, bizarre. and it's considerably more developed in males, which goes to the, if the males are the one talking, like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. They also sense. thought it might act as a buoyancy device during diving or floating Ooh, interesting mm-hmm. but then why would other seals not have it because they're not as big as other seals that you but well, maybe I it's guess the, in the water divers or something more. yeah true and they are in the water a lot more than some other seals too interesting yeah yeah, yeah that was really cool and who knows um and because yeah because they said they have other special features that are probably related to the deep diving they have proportionally heavier internal organs so they mm. think so maybe they need if they have heavier organs maybe they need to have that buoyancy to pull them back true. up um yeah. They have the highest red blood cell count and blood volume and hemoglobin of all seals. Which makes sense if they're deep divers. Right. You need to they need more oxygen. oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So cool. Uh, and you know, it's probably one of those things where it's like, it probably is for reproduction and I mean the vocalizations, but maybe it has a dual purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought that was neat. Um, the only I don't uh, I'll let you do the uh, I think you have the, the do you have the how old they get? Um, I did not. Ah, so, so they live have that one go for about it. twenty to thirty years. The oldest one they know of is twenty six. So oh, pretty similar to to most a lot seals. of seals, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the so this intrigued me. This is my last one that I have, and it goes with photo ID, right? <laughs> so that we you guys know we love that. Um, the exact size and position of the markings varies for each seal. So the ribbon could be used but it's really kind of hard it's like you know where mm. does it undulate i think you know right so in the next position so you really have to have really good pictures mm-hmm. so it's not really feasible to do for a photo id thing i think that's why they that one seal they didn't figure out yeah. um but it's but they are unique so yeah i mean that's one if you're able to do some kind of like computer-based analysis where you can map mm-hmm. the exact position of it yeah, you have to body. be like in relation to like the amount of dark yeah. and light that it has in these certain spots. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool though. Yeah, I was like, because that, that, that was where I always, technology will take us, right? And I always look at that whenever I see an animal. Like, could you uh, can you identify the individuals? <laughs> So right, especially when they have those striking markings, you're like, right. oh, of course you can. I mean, it's like zebras. You're like, of course you can ID those guys, right? Right. Like, I mean, yeah. I might not want to do it, but you know, <laughs> but you be, can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to. Uh, I think we're like with zebras, like there's more stripes, so there's. I think it would be easier than just the it one would, yeah. ribbon. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's got some things against it for that, but mm-hmm. um, but that's uh, that's yeah, that's I think that's what I've had for the ribbon yeah. suit. So that surprisingly, uh, quite a bit there, even though we don't know a lot about them, um, but they're beautiful. So go check them out. And especially the Unbridled Joy and Obesity Pups. Because they're <laughs> oh my just God. ridiculous. I feel like I just want to go Google a bunch of pictures of baby seals now, I know, which right? I might, which I might actually do. Just to make you just, just, you know, it's a good enough yeah. thing at the end of the day. Just like, I need something cute. There you go. Yeah. Bring, at some, cats, bring some joy. At, yeah. Seal pups. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right, so that's what we have for the ribbon seal. Next week, our next episode, we will be back to likely a journal review. Um, so we'll pick out a fun one to do. And be sure to check out our website for any merch you might want for Pac Man. Um, we've got some cute stuffed animals in there. Maybe not as cute as a ribbon seal pup, but um, there's pretty still- darn cute, though. Pretty darn cute. Um, and um, be sure to check out our social media pages Facebook and Instagram to keep up with us. Sign up for our newsletter on the website. Um, we'll keep you updated on what we're what we've got going on and of course make sure you keep track of our instagram for the next poll for the next green memo highlight next month um i don't know what maybe we'll put the waddell seal up against somebody else or do something completely new 
who knows? <laughs> uh, and if you have suggestions, please let us know. We'd love to um, see what you guys want to listen to. So with that, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P-A-C-M-A-M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.